Hey guys, welcome into the Bear With Us podcast. I'm Jack, he's Frank. Frank, it's becoming a lot easier, not going to lie to you. I thought this would be an easy, like a way bigger, way more of a big deal in terms of that transition to the new name, but it's just so seamless. It just fits, it works so well. It's really easy. Bear With Us podcast, episode three. I don't know what that makes this in our in our total podcast series. Might be a 90, like 89, 90. 89, not, yeah, something like that. But that's not so even that accurate means, either, though. That was the real. No, Remember, we had no. like 40 episodes. Yes, yeah, so and then we had a long hiatus. Yeah, we're cruising over 100, no doubt about it. Um, which means people have listened to us for at least 100 hours of content, which is just sad. Like, there, <laughs> there are better people to listen to, I'm going to be honest with you. Jack, no, Jesus kidding. Christ. This is uh this is this is the premier your premier source for Bears content. Uh analysis, breakdowns, optimism, pessimism. If if you really are looking for something to get negative about, I got yeah. you know, I got that for and, you. And you know what? Unlike these other podcasts, we're really about it. Olin Crutes, come try that shit over here with the Bear With Us podcast, bitch. That's him saying that. That's not me. <laughs> That's <laughs> Take, no, let me stop. Let there. me stop. I know he he can't take jokes, fucking pussy. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that okay. Let's just move on before we both get beat up. Um so Frank, uh we we were gonna do the schedule episode. We were gonna go over the schedule after the it, it release, but there wasn't really a whole lot of intrigue to talk about. There were a couple things I wanted to discuss, but I think we can roll that into the bigger picture of today's episode, which is 2022 why the bears could be good because i think people are it it's been ever since 2018 it's been like this weird thing where everybody nationally is like this bears team is gonna suck they're gonna be terrible remember that it was what was it like 2020 where yeah. they were, were listed to go like three and 13 or something people were like yeah i can see that and it's like what team were you fucking watching? This there's too much talent to go three and thirteen, uh, and and I believe this year they're they're projected to be like a top five drafting team, which means that their record is most likely going to be, you know, around three to five wins. That's that seems to be about where the top five teams are drafting. So I think we can kind of roll it in. Uh, again, there's not a ton of intrigue to talk about this year. There's a couple opponents that I'm interested in, but you know, I I think we can get to that. Um, so I know you kind of put together a list of, of why you think the bears are going to be good. Uh, and, and I wanted to, you know, you kind of touched on all the big points, so I'm, I'm going to let you kind of give the overall view and then we can kind of just talk about it back and forth and see if I agree or maybe, maybe even disagree a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will say I put this list together in the lens of like, this is what has to happen. Um, for the Bears to be a playoff if the team stars this year. align, yeah, yeah, and and but some of it, some of it I believe will happen, and some of it I'm like I don't know, but this is gonna have to happen. Um, so I think we'll start offense first because I think we, you know, I know we're changing schemes, uh, you know, with the with the defensive head coach now we're going to the to back to like the cover two, but we know what that looks like, right? And it's like we've seen that success before. So there's still some question marks there, but it's a lot less, I think, than the offensive side since the offensive guru that we had uh, wasn't so much of a guru the last four years. Um, so let's start offense. Very first thing. And, and you know what? I think what we can dive in is like, what does this mean to each of us? Because it may look a little bit different. But the very first thing, and this should become, you know, this should come as no shock to any or to no shock to anybody. Justin Fields takes a step or multiple steps forward in his development and he proves to be in year two like a top 15 a top half quarterback right like it's unrealistic if for you know to say like yeah like he can be top 10 or top five. if that happens that's phenomenal we've seen that happen before in year two for quarterbacks I'm just saying we don't have to it didn't have to be that significant but if he's a top 15 top 16 quarterback we're in we're in pretty good shape um so let me just field the question to you. Like, what does that look like to you? What does Justin Fields taking a step forward look like to you? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I don't even know if it's necessarily Justin Fields controlling that next step. Um, obviously, there's a lot of ways he can improve his game, uh, you know, making the correct reads, uh, feeling that pressure a little bit more than in a season where he just took way too many sacks, obviously. Um there, 
you know, footwork things, just understanding where certain plays are supposed to go. I think that's how he can take step forward. In terms of just overall who can help him do that, I think Luke Getze is really the one who's going to have to help him. Um, the, I mean, Justin Fields really could only run the plays that Matt Nagy, who we all agree was incompetent, can call. And I don't know how many weeks in a row we're just screaming at our TVs or you and I into these podcast microphones, roll them out, you know, make this field, you know, take half the field away, run the ball, use David Montgomery, use Khalil Herbert, use some of these guys that you brought in. Uh, So if the offense is a little more simplified and brings out maybe tailored to Justin Fields strengths a little bit more, I think that's going to help him take those next steps. Um, Because it it does kind of have to work congruently. Uh, What just doesn't make sense, Frank, and and something I want to make clear that we will not have on this podcast, I will not have anybody saying that the Bears are giving up on Justin Fields because it just makes no fucking sense. And I've been seeing this way too much. And what I don't understand is, Frank, they're doing, Bears fans that are saying this stuff are doing what we have been calling for them to do to Mitch Trubisky for four years, where they acknowledge that Matt Nagy's the problem or is a problem and they wanted him gone. But then they also say, say that Justin Fields sucks, but it's like the same people who were like saying that Mitch wasn't that bad and it was all Matt Nagy. So it's like, I don't understand how you're making this jump from especially what we saw in the Steelers game at the end of that San Francisco game. Like the, the, the highs of Justin Fields are clearly there. I don't know what you say or what, what you saw that you're like, this guy's fucking terrible. He can't get it done. It's like, what are we, what are we doing? So I had to get that out there because it's especially your number one point of why this whole thing can work. Listen, we've seen quarterbacks take that step in in year two and just be absolutely insane. Joe Burrow just did it. Granted, he had a much better rookie season than Justin Fields did. I'm not going to argue that. But he did take that next step and become, what, maybe a top five quarterback in the league? I mean, you could definitely make that argument. So I don't think it's impossible that Justin Fields takes that next step. I just think that it's not all going to be on him, right? I think Luke Getze and his offense is really going to need to be what helps him do that. Yeah, and, and obviously that's a huge point as well that we'll we'll you know dive into here in a minute. But for me, him taking a step forward looks like some of the things that you mentioned. Um, you know, that internal processor being a little bit quicker to see things. Um, obviously, Luke Getze is going to be a huge help with that. With like every play didn't have to be you reading a defense for two, three seconds and making a decision. We can shorten the field. We can cut the field in half. We can give you one read and go plays just to keep the defense on their toes because he ran like a fucking four, three. I mean, this dude's, this dude's one of the best athletes at the quarterback position uh, in the NFL. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, and again, we'll dive further into like what Luke Getzey can do and just sort of what we know of his uh, philosophy thus far. Um, but that internal processor one has to be quicker. And we did see that get better as the year went on last year. Um, but beyond that, because even when there were times where I felt like his internal, like he started to feel that pressure, I need a little bit better and sometimes a lot of bit better pocket manipulation from from Justin Fields. I feel like he's so athletic to a fault. We're so like that, that play he made against the Niners. Spectacular. Wonderful. But you can't do that every single time. Like to a de- there, there's a degree of luck in this that the first guy you made a miss with the spin cycle and now you're off. And he would try that before and get hit in the back or get hit in the side. You know, he had rib issues and things. And it's like, Justin, step up in the pocket sometimes. You don't always have to roll right back out to try to make up like this huge, crazy play. Uh, and and, and that, that just comes with experience. You know, that comes with with reps and things. But I would like to see a, a lot more of that. Um, and <clears throat> I think, you know, people are like throwing on stats. Like, what can his stats look like in this? And it's like, that's the last thing on my mind. <laughs> You know, when when it's when it's coming uh, down to, you know, what I want to see from Justin Fields, if he throws for forty eight hundred and this many stuff, great, that's phenomenal. But like in terms of expectations, I think sort of the the third biggest piece for me is just having that like level of uh, what is the right word, just like togetherness with his receivers. Just like you can tell they're on the same page because a lot of what we saw last year, and again, we don't know if it was his fault. The receivers fought a little bit of both, but they just clearly weren't on the same page. And the thing that we hearkened back to was like, this dude got no first team reps, you know, all throughout the offseason. It was this constant battle of will it be him or will it be Dalton? 
that should be nullified. Like, I, I don't want to use it as an excuse this year with, oh, it's a new system and it's a new this. We have a full off season to work here. You have your number one target back. That should only elevate things. That should make things easier. You know, uh, <clears throat> your whole running back room is back, except for uh, Ebner, who we added through the draft. Like, there's some continuity here, even offensive line. There's some continuity here that should be able to help this uh, this thing along. And that's really what I, what I want to say. Cohesiveness, I think, is the word that I was looking for. Because last year, there were times where they were like, oh, what an awful throw by Justin. And you watch the replay, and you're like, he, like, again, and so it's just not to take anyone there. <laughs> right. But, and it's not even to take the blame away from me. It could have been his fault. Like, he's the one that misread the play. Like, because we, especially we know what, what Nagy liked to do was the static stuff. You both have to read the same thing and both have to be on the same page. And it's sort of a timing thing. And that would be thrown off. And again, <clears throat> it was probably a mix of like, him not getting the reps, you know, uh, him and the receiver not being on the same page and him reading the defense wrong on certain occasions. It's, it's a little bit of everything. But again, that's out the window. Like we have a full year. You're the starter. You're the QB one. Let's go and do it. Um, and that's really w- w- what I look at this year for him as is like, let's get a full year under our belt. If you can take those steps forward. I mean, you again, just like you said, you've sh- he's shown so many flashes last year. Uh, and, and if we bring up Mitch Trubisky, I said it last year and I'll continue to say that. And if anyone wants to debate me, like, feel free to come on the show and we can bring up like literal examples of this. I saw more in Justin Fields in year one than I saw from Mitch Trubisky in year and in four years. Think of like the high level insane throws that Justin Fields made. The the couple rolling to the left where he just throws like a cross. Not, it's not even really across his body because it was the same. You know what I'm talking about? The, the, the Horstead touchdown or the Jesse James touchdown. And I think it was a Horstead yeah. touchdown. And then like, the one where he threads the needle to Jimmy Graham down the uh, down the seam. The only throw that comes to my mind when I think of Mitch Trubisky is that insane throw that he had. I don't remember <laughs> was it against Atlanta where he was rolling right and he sort of it was sort of the same thing. Like you threw he threw you know off one leg and launched it like forty yards and you're like wow where the fuck has that been his whole Bears career? But that was it. Like he's never had any other. We were like wow that was a throw. And Justin had just off the top of my head. I'm sure if I watch his film I'll start to remember others. He had like four or five top of my head. Bam and a predictable bad offense. So it's like him making those steps forward. It isn't like as egregious as some people are making it out to see. And I think people are tying it back to the point you've made of like, they've given up on him. And it's like, no, they haven't. They've invested a lot more. I think than people realize, which I think brings me to my second biggest thing, uh, which was the offensive line that like people keep talking about the skill positions and don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not trying to be a, a, you know, a hypocrite. There were guys in that second round that I wanted bad. And I'm still a little upset that we got a safety over some of those guys. I, so I'm in that boat to a degree. I'm not there saying they gave up on him by any means. They, they were going off of their board. And again, if this kid winds up being the next fucking Ed Reed, no one's going to blink an eye, you know. Um, <clears throat> but the offense, I mean, they are just throwing people at the offensive line. Um, and, you know, everything for me. I trust Ryan Poles as it stands right now. He was very honest and upfront, not only in the interview process with George, but with the media and with the fans. He was like, look, I hated what I saw from this offensive line, and we're going to get that fixed immediately. So, you know, while people are like hearkening on, oh, the, the, you know, is, is Cole Komet really a guy? Is Can Darnell Mooney be, a, be an X? Can so-and-so do this? Is Velas Jones even that good? None of that fucking matters if your quarterback's on his back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you need yeah. the offensive line to get fixed. So, I mean, what what have been your thoughts so far on what they've done with the offensive line? Um, you know, are you encouraged? Is it a wait and see thing? I think, yeah, I think it is just going to be a wait and see thing. There, there was no big name that, you know, like uh, Jay-Z Treader or some of these other guys, you know, uh, some of the free agent left tackles that, that were signed or, you know, it wasn't like the the Bears went out and pulled a you know a Chiefs move where they traded for Orlando Brown Jr. or anything like that. None of the names they got really stuck out to you. So it is going to be kind of a wait and see moment. I think it speaks to what Brian Pace ultimately saw last year when he drafted the the offensive tackles that he did, uh, trading up for Tevin Jenkins, obviously, and then also drafting Larry Borum. I. Ryan Pace didn't just come in and absolutely obliterate the offensive line room. He was kept some guys in there. Cody Whitehair is still a thing. Um, and he's going to make people battle and work for their jobs. Um, you know, he signed Lucas Patrick. He signed uh, Dozier, I think it is, from from Minnesota. And then, of, of course, as we saw on draft night, he just drafted like a thousand, <laughs> uh, uh, like a four offensive linemen uh, in, in the last couple rounds uh, that people were encouraged by so 
it is going to be a wait and see thing. It also, Tevin, Larry Borum, uh, you know, same thing with with uh, Cody Whitehair as well. They're playing in a different offense. So maybe if you didn't like things you saw from those guys last year, maybe it was the offense they were running in. Um, so I, unfortunately, it is going to be a wait and see moment. Uh, but what I'm going to be really looking for is is health. And, and this will attribute back to Justin Fields real quick as well. To take that next step, he has to be on the field. And you brought up a really good point when it comes to rib injuries. I really hope that's drilled into him this offseason. Do not turn your back to defenders because they will hit you with their helmets right into your ribs and you'll miss games. <laughs> this team can't afford. I mean, I guess it doesn't. No, you know what? I'll, I'll continue saying it. This team can't afford to to lose Justin Fields for a few games here or there because it's just it's all about his development. He he's the main focus of this team of this franchise. They can't afford to miss games where they aren't seeing his progression one way or the other. If it's negative things, get that ironed out. If it's positive things, obviously you want to see more of that so you feel confident building around the future of of Justin Fields. Same thing with the offensive line. This team cannot waste time figuring out if if these are the right pieces. This rebuild, it doesn't feel like a real bit rebuild. It feels more like just kind of getting the right pieces in place. So this team in the front office needs to know who are those right pieces? Who can we build around? Yeah. And you know what, Jack, I, I, I think I'm, I'm a little more optimistic. Maybe not optimistic is the right word. I, I'm a little more confident in this moment in this offensive line than it sounds like you are. I, I'm, I'm past the wait and see. Um, Larry Borum is legit at right tackle. I, I think he's going to man that down. Um, I know the first game from Tevin Jenkins was tough, but when after that, there was one There was one more particular quarter. Maybe it was the next game where it was a quarter he had, but, but after that, he started to really get his footing down, and I thought he looked really, really good. Um, so everything that I've heard of Lucas Patrick has been very, very good thus far. I really like the type of center that we got from him, and, and let's make no mistake, Sam Mustafer was bad. Uh, you know, again, Olin Krutz, I'll fight you for charity if you got something wrong with, you know, me saying that that Sam Mustafer is uh, a, a, was a bad center because he was like he had he did really well that first year when they called him up. But teams figured something out with him and it just was not very good. Um, so he's more than likely out. Well, he, he's out at center for sure. Left guard, it sounds like uh, Cody Whitehair is going to be playing left guard is, is from by, by all reports. The only question mark is right guard, and it looks like they're just going to be throwing bodies at it. Zachary Thomas, six-round pick, has been getting some reps in the rookie uh, uh, rookie camp and then all the OTAs. Um, it sounds like uh, Mustafer's getting a shot to play some right guard there as well. Um, and there's one more. Uh, was it Braxton Jones, or is he just going to be a swing Jones. tackle? I, th I think they're trying him out at left tackle for now, uh, and then if it ends up not working, they'll, they'll, they'll probably slide him into guard. Yeah, but I think, I, I mean, all in all, the only question mark for me right now is right guard. Um, and, and you know, not for nothing, guards aren't as, like, as long as we solidify the tackle positions, guards aren't as hard to find even mid-year if someone goes down. Like, they're just not, they're, they're I feel like I was going to say something that was going to come across as disrespectful. The way we were talking <laughs> about, um, you know, the, the the way that we talked about certain positions in the draft where it's like, they're all like running backs. Like they're just all pretty fucking good. There's some that are special, but they're all just really good. So you sort of lose value in that case. That's the way that guards are. Guards are just like all really good in this league. So like there's going to be guys that are potential starters that get cut, you know, as they're trimming down to the 53 man roster. There's going to be guys in, in the middle of the year that are cut or that are you're going to be able to trade like a six round pick to get. That's the, like maybe he's their swing tackle, but it could be a starting guard elsewhere. Like, I'm not as worried about that. And I really liked what I saw out of Larry Borum um, and and Tevin Jenkins last year. And again, I think the guys that we have right now, I think, are are, are more than viable on the inside. I, I like everything that I hear from uh, well about Lucas Patrick. He just has that like mean streak that I know Ryan Pace is or Ryan Poles, I'm sorry, is looking for. Um, so I'm really optimistic about them. And I, I also think like just knowing what we know about last year and how good that the guys who are still going to be here were at run blocking, uh, which can really lead us into point number three with uh, <clears throat> with, with Luke Getze. The biggest negative I think about Matt Nagy, outside of maybe questionable leadership that started to come out later, I just mean like as an X's and O's guy, from about mid-2019, people were literally starting to like 
analyze what he was doing, and they were they were saying, well, it looks like he just sort of runs the ball just to say he ran the ball, and he's not setting anything <laughs> else up later. Like, there's no boot action off of it. There's Play no, action. like, yeah, yeah. There, there is no, like, we stuff. have, like, four plays out of the same, pa- you know, out of the same package, so you don't know if it's going to be a run. Like, we all knew it was going to be a run. He ran it, and then he just threw the ball for the rest of the quarter or the rest of that drive, and it's like, everything that we know from Luke Getze, that's going to be the complete opposite of that. He's looking to run the ball to set up Justin Fields to do some of the things we mentioned earlier, shorten the field, half in the field, do things like that, get, you know, even just get him out on a, on a quarterback naked or just whatever it is. Um, so, I mean, Jack, talk to me about Luke Getze. What have, what have you heard? Where, where do you stand with it right now? Outside of like the unknown, like we obviously we're never going to know until we know, but like, wh- what do you, what do you take from what we're hearing about him as it stands? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, we've heard, we've heard obviously what he's liked about Justin Fields and that he's liked his approach. He's liked what he's seen so far in, in camp, I guess there, there's not even a really full like training camp or, really anything that they can use to and he's not going to give anything away right he's not going to talk about what offense he's going to run we're not going to see this offense and what it actually looks like until about week one like until we're not going to see anything in the preseason we're going to just see what i'm going to be looking for frank is communication right because that seemed to be one of the things that was a constant theme regardless of who was playing quarterback for the bears these last couple years whether it was mitch whether it was Nick Foles, whether it was Justin Fields, whether it was Andy Dalton. Communication with Matt Nagy was not good. He just wasn't a good communicator. He wasn't clear on what he needed to do play-wise. So, you know, and and that's why when the change was made originally to Bill Lazor, so many guys, whether they were scoring a lot of points or not, it was clear that something had changed and something was working a little bit better. If this thing is going to get on track and they may surprise people communication between the quarterback and the offensive coordinator is going to be key. Um, versatility. I, I know, um, you know, everyone's making a real big point about, you know, Oh, well, they didn't draft a receiver uh, until Vellis Jones. He's, you know, 25. They didn't sign any big free agent outside of Byron Pringle. Like they're not doing enough at the receiver position. Still fair arguments, I think, that, to be made. But I don't think it's as bad um, as I think everyone's making it sound. Uh, <laughs> Darnell Mooney is still a, a very good player. Um, you know, they'll be looking for him to kind of contain, um, you know, keep up the thousand yard streak, the multiple multiple touchdowns. Um, I don't know if he's going to be that number one guy, that Devontae Adams, but having Luke Getze, who was – the wide receiver coach for, for the Packers and Devonte Adams turned into that guy makes me feel a little bit better about where they're at. Um, but I think having multiple weapons is, is not a bad thing, especially in that running back room with uh, Ebner, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm I, you know very excited to see what he can do, bring to the table. Uh, Cause as much as, you know, we like Khalil Herbert and what he brought last year, he definitely is more of that downhill type running back, not that pass catching weapon. So I think communication is going to be key. Um, not getting stuck in the same routine and not being predictable, obviously. And and again, just making things easier for your second year quarterback. And if that is play action, if that is running the football, bring it back to the basics, make it easy, but also put your own flair on it too. make this your offense, not just, you know, something people would just see and say, well, that was too easy. Yeah, 100%. Really the biggest thing for me uh, is that versatility. Um, you know, everyone keeps talking about the X, they need the X guy, the X, they need the X receiver. And, and that's one thing that Luke Getzey sort of has sort of touched on where he's like, there is no X receiver in my offense. Like p- people have this, th- th- that's like spawned from the West coast offense, like the X, the X, like you line him up in the same spot, no matter who's there, no matter who's guarding, he's going to beat everybody. And Luke Getzey's like, look, we, that's not what we do. Like what we're going to do, like. We can have someone who can beat everyone. Like, that's what you want talent-wise. But even if we had Devontae Adams, you didn't see how much he moved in Green Bay. He played the slot for full games at a time if they didn't like the – like, if if someone ran a straight cover two or cover three and they're like, why would I have him have a harder time with Richard Sherman when I can put him in the fucking slot and know he's going to go against the linebacker? 
And he's like, that's what we're going to do here. So like we have faith that we can move every one of these guys around and be very versatile to create matchups that we like. And just like hearing that was so refreshing to me. Again, he has to prove it. You know, like we, we heard a lot of things from Matt and Aggie coming in. I will say though, that's been the drastic difference between hearing about Matt Nagy's offense and Luke Getz's offense is that all we heard was, oh, Matt Nagy, well, he, he's a he's a quarterback guru. He's a guru. Well, what's his offense on? He's, he's a guru. He's going to run. He's going to run fucking Reed's offense. Oh, all right. That sounds I mean, for for like a, a, an offensive stricken town, we were like, well, fuck, yeah, we're getting Andy Reed. But it's like if you think seriously, Jack, think when has he ever even like at, at his time here, like once he was here, he never said like, oh, yeah, this is what we do. He just said, oh, it takes three years to learn this. I think like, and we sort of came to the conclusion that he was sort of buying time then. I think he knew like he had his first OTA and he was like, shit, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, let me just tell what? everyone it takes years to catch it. But it, it's was, like, no. it was 101, Frank. It was 101. And yeah. then you graduate to the 202. Yeah. And then eventually you'll be, you'll be Dr. You'll be Dr. Mitch Trubisky. You'll just you be know, one exactly. of the plays in your dreams. Yeah. No, I mean, but from what we're hearing from Lou Getze, we're getting like bits and pieces of this is who we're going to be. He's not diving in too much where like people can get a read on it. But like, you know, it's sort of the same like Kyle Shanahan would describe his offensive as being versatile. That's not giving anything away. We we just saw Debo Samuel play fucking running back for Christ's sake. You know what I mean? Like so. But, but what I'm getting at is like hearing things like that already tells me that they're, they're sort of identifying what people can and can't do. And that's not only going to help the offense as a whole, it's going to help Justin Fields. It's going to help him understand when there's matchups and he can make hot reads and things like that. To, you know, have little hot route options and, and, and audibles and such. Like, that, that to me means their mind is already there, uh, which is super exciting. And, and again, not for nothing with, with I, I would like more talent at the receiver position. Let's make no mistake. But you look at the guys that we do have. Darnell Mooney came into this league. It's like, oh, well, he's a burner. He's clearly shown he's more than that. Like, yeah, I, who knows if he's a real number one, but he's a really good route runner. He, he made numerous plays uh, over the middle of the field last year. He wasn't scared to get hit by safeties. He still has that straight line speed. Byron Pringle is a little bit of the same player. Like, he's a very similar player to that. And again, Bellis Jones looks like he's a guy that you want to be creative with and get the ball in his hands. Like, we have guys who are very versatile. So, yeah, maybe we're missing, not maybe, we're missing a Devontae Adams, a, a, you know, a Tyreek Hill, but so are fucking 30 other teams. These guys don't grow on trees. Like, yeah. look at Kansas City's wide receiver core right now. Who looks amazing to you? But no one's questioning that. Uh, gr granted, I'm not saying they should. Andy Reid is Andy Reid. He's garnered that respect. But what I'm saying is, Hopefully we can, hopefully Luke Getze is that. Hopefully what we have is that. That's what we're going to need, especially in year one to be a contender. That's what it's going to have to be. It's like we're in that sort of system that it's like, oh, it doesn't, we can plug in anybody and, and I have faith, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing too, uh, regarding just Luke Getze and, and the offense, I, I do like the versatility and we, and we saw, you know, people are counting out guys like Byron Pringle from the jump for some reason, like he produced in the chiefs offense. I mean, granted it wasn't, you know, he wasn't catching, you know, a thousand yard seasons or anything, but he didn't need to, that wasn't his role. He was the, uh, he was the third receiver behind guys like Tyreek Hill and, and, uh, and, and Travis Kelsey, like he was one of Patrick Mahomes guys. So doesn't that kind of strike you as like maybe that's someone who can in in a bigger role perform a little bit more? I, I feel confident about it. Um, and again, you look at Velas Jones, kind of getting kind of getting excited about him, Frank. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna I, lie. I don't know if it's me talking funny. myself into it, Jack, but I, I I'm serious I when I say the only two negative things that I saw from Scouts was maybe his route tree isn't the most developed and that he's a little bit older. But that's you can't fix age. It is what it is. I mean, who fucking, he, he's still, he's going to play out this first contract, whether he's 22 or 25 anyway. That, and it that, wasn't that, like that he was drafted matter. in the first, he wasn't drafted in the first round. He was drafted in the third round. That's yeah. That, I mean, like, granted, he probably else. went ahead of some guys. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's room to be excited. I, I know, you know, one thing that bears fans overall like to do is, is they like to use the off season to kind of get a little bit more excited about the roster than they probably should. I think, uh, that's one of the biggest problems is that the, a lot of fans have overrated the roster to a certain degree. Like 
2019, 2020, when it's like, he kind of looking at this roster, like, I don't know if they're going to be very good, but then he got people Super Bowl, baby, we're going, this is the year that and it happens every year. It's it's fan bases get excited and then that's totally fine. Um, but I, I think there is room to be realistic that if what we're being sold is what we're going to get, there's reasons to be excited about this offense, about what this yeah. offense can be, what it can look like. I'm not asking for what I was asking for in, going into 2018, where, you know, we're sold on, like you said, this is Andy Reid's offense. Matt Nagy's the the next coming. Like, this, it, he's the next Sean McVay. And I'm not asking for this team to constantly put up 35 to 40 points. That'd be great. But I need this offense to look competent. I need it to look like, at, by the end of the year, what I want to say is, if we can add a few more pieces to this offense, this can be really something. That's what I'm honestly hoping for at, by the end of this season. Because I don't think they're there, right? Like, I, I think they could add a little more to the to the wide receiver room for sure. Maybe the offensive line, depending on how these pieces perform. But, I mean, as opposed to... This offense is broken by the end of 2018. Yeah. Like they need to figure this whole thing. Like, what are they going to do moving forward? What is this thing going to look like? I'm tired of asking questions like that. Like, where's the play action? Where's the rollouts? Where's the simple reads? Like, if if we get that, like you said earlier, stats don't mean a goddamn thing to me. Get get it I to agree. the point where it looks like an NFL offense that this that this town really has not seen at all. No, I totally agree. And I think some smaller tidbits before we move over to the defense, Jack, for me, is um, this is a huge year for Darnell Mooney. Not like he's at risk of losing his job, but like, dude, they have faith in you. Yeah. Like, they they didn't Super break Bowl. the bank to get Tyreek Hill. He's Super the reason Bowl, that man. we're going to go to the Super Bowl, you know? And not just no, going. We're, we're going to win it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I think I, I, I'm in – in one respect, they didn't break the bank on a receiver because we're just not built that way. And we have a competent front office that wasn't like we got two seconds. We can get to the first. We can get to the first and get the seventh receiver at, at 28. Right. So we have that that level of competence there. Um, but again, there were some receivers. I mean, what was stopping us from signing DJ Chark to that one year eight million dollar deal to compete? I mean, he, he's more of a legitimate X type of guy. Like that's the type of receiver that he can be, you know, when he's healthy. But it's like I I, I think people are sort of mistaking them not doing things like that with, you know, like you said, not having faith in Justin Fields, but I think they have a lot of faith in Darnell. Like again, and that was why like, as, as the reports started coming out, I, I told you, I was like, what I'm not going to do at least for this year is put a cap on what this kid can do. Like he is clearly taking steps and steps and not for nothing. Everyone from the last regime to this regime has only talked about his work ethic. This dude is a fucking work machine. This guy is in love with football, man. Like he, he wants to be great at this. So again, and that, that's not me go, you know, jumping off the deep end saying like fucking 1500 yard. Like, I'm not saying that I'm just saying, there's no reason for us to cap this guy. It's like, Oh, well, he's a really good wide receiver too. Cause he, and that may be what he is, but to me, Jack, that's his floor, man. Like that's not his ceiling. You know, and I think this is the year to really establish that. Like, maybe you really are a wide receiver one, and then maybe we just sprinkle a couple possession guys around you with all the speed that we got. Um, but the other thing, second thing for me, and then I'll throw it to you if you have anything, is is, is honestly Cole Komet. Uh, and this is going to be a season where we really know who – this is where I said, like, oh, it's not like Darnell move lose his job. Cole Komet could lose his job this year. I know he, I know he took a decent step last year, but, you know, year three for a tight end is is big. Is, is really big, especially because, oh, well, you correct me if I'm wrong, second round picks don't get a fifth round option, right? We have to make a decision after correct. year four. So, I mean, this is this is humongous for him. And, and you know, we think about, uh, I mean, you, you brought up Patrick Mahomes a couple of times. Who's his favorite target? It wasn't Tyreek Hill. <laughs> when, when he yeah. needed to make a throw, he was eyeballing Travis Kelsey. I'm not asking... Uh, I'm not asking Cole Komet to be Travis Kelsey. That's not what I'm doing. But the point that I'm making is that tight ends are huge for quarterback development. They need to be on the same page. They need to have that level of trust. The guy that I would like him to be as his floor is Jason Witt. The guy that on third down, you know we're going to him. The guy on third down, in short, we know we can leave you in there because you can block. You know, and he did make strides blocking last year. Like we don't have to. You're not just Jimmy Graham. You're not just basically a, a six-seven slot receiver that that is a little bit closer to the line. 
You know what I mean? Like we need you to be that. And I think he's taken some of those steps with this year, especially if you're talking about the bears being a playoff team, yeah. he needs to take that step to be a really, really good tight end. And he needs to, I mean, obviously number one thing is he needs to clean up the drops. Um, that's, that's his number one thing for sure. He needs to clean up the drops. And, but what I'll be curious about is, I mean, one thing that the Packers didn't really use a lot as much as we thought Matt Nagy would is focus on the tight end position, right? Like the Chiefs, like you were saying, that's where Matt Nagy came from. Travis Kelsey, big part, focal part of, of that offense. And once we drafted Cole Komet first, that was the first pick in the second round, first pick overall for the Bears. We were like, okay, here we go. This is this is the next, this is the next thing. This is what they need to make this offense work. I literally remember saying that to you. Uh, and in our, I think it, God damn, it must have been like one of our earliest corked up podcast episodes when he first got drafted in, in 2019, and we're like, maybe this is what is needed to to make this thing work. Um, and I, I'm curious to see how much Getsy relies on the tight end position. You know what that will really look like in this offense. Um, but again, I'm I'm looking. <laughs> the very least, he needs to take like a. Mike Jasicki type jump at the very least 800 yards, six or seven touchdowns, like enough with the no touchdown stuff that that can't. I, and again, I know it's play calling and, and Komet did look good at times, but there was just something, it was just something missing, right? Like we, I haven't seen that elite level tight end at the very least top 10 tight end. And, and again, there's not that many in the NFL. Right. We, we talk about it all the time, yeah. fantasy wise. There's room for him to grow. I totally agree with you. This is this is going to be big. He needs to be that X factor for this offense. to Because, to, I mean, Frank, like that's the thing. And, and I think Bears fans are just so out on him, whether it's fair or not. But, I mean, you hear them talk about, you know, the wide receiver position. You almost never hear anybody like mentioned Cole Komet alongside Darnell Mooney. Like it's just not really something that, that people really talk about. This is his opportunity to really change that opinion of him. Like you said, moving forward. So I agree with you. Yeah, Big totally year. agree. Did you, uh, did you have anything else before we move over to the defense? <laughs> just something while I was, while we were talking, I thought it was, was uh, I thought it was funny from, from my end. Uh, you were talking about, <laughs> you're talking about the bears and the wide receivers and, and, you know, what it's going to look like this year compared to last year. Hey, man, Byron Pringle might not, uh, he won't be falling down. Let's just say that as, uh, as in Vellis Jones wearing number 12, um, you know, he may not have issues last year. I, I, I can't believe Allen Robinson did not get more shit last year for what he was doing in Chicago. Like nobody talked about the fact that he was literally just fucking falling down, not completing routes, things like not helping out his rookie quarterback. Like I get, he didn't want to be here and that's partly the front office and that's partly Matt Nagy, but like dude, show some fucking professionalism. I, 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 I think anything is an upgrade over Allen Robinson from yeah. last year. And that's, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that was going to be <clears throat> one of my points when it came to the offense as well was like, people are acting like it was such a big loss for us. And this is actually a really good transition into, into the defense. Like, Cause there's another guy uh, that people think it's going to be a huge loss for us that I just don't see. But Allen Robinson wasn't Allen Robinson last year. He wasn't that guy. Like we have last year's Allen Robinson. So please don't take this out of context. People who are listening, we have about two or three receivers better on this rush that are better than last year's Allen Robinson. Now, if he goes on to do Allen Robinson things with the Rams, obviously that's a guy you want on your team. But he was over this situation. It, it, it was what it was. It's it's it was very clear, like you said, he didn't want to be here. Um, but again, I think that's a perfect segue into you know people like losing their shit, still even about losing, uh, not losing, trading away Khalil Mack. And I mean, we hadn't had Khalil Mack since 2018. 2019 was still a solid season, but then the years the years after that, uh, 2020. I mean, even 2019 wasn't that good of us. He had eight and a half sacks. 2020, he has nine sacks. Last year, he plays seven games, and he looked good for those seven games. But again, you only played seven games. Like, you're talking about an aging player. He, he He's 30 years old now. Um, and and it's honestly, I don't even know if it's as much as the age is like, it, every year was always a little something. Well, he wasn't completely him because he had a chest last year. It was, oh, well, he had this shoulder thing for week six and eight. And 
okay, dude. Like I, 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 I will not like, I'm not one of those fans. that's like, Oh, you're soft play through the injury. That's ridiculous to me. But when you start having that track record of being hurt, I'm okay with letting you go. If we can get really good value from you. Right. It's like, if you're just not helping us, cause, and that, that was my biggest gripe then. And my comparison was always with Chris Bryant. Well, his wrist just isn't feeling. Then sit out. You're not helping your team. Khalil Mack, when he was playing hurt, was not helping this team. He, he, he just didn't look like himself. He wasn't making that impact, especially making $160 million. Do you, I'd rather have you sit and, and have Travis Gibson get some more reps than, than you be in here hurt. Um, but people are acting like it's the end of the world without him. But I thought, <clears throat> I think it was Alex Brown who broke this down. He was like, he knew that one of them was going to have to be traded between Robert Quinn and Khalil Mack. Because in this defense, they play the same exact position. There is no, like, both sides aren't pass rushers. One is your run stuffer on, on uh, the d- defensive end, and the other defensive end is going to be your pass rusher. And you can flip-flop them depending on what, you know, what side of the field you're on or whatever. But you're never going to, unless it's like a third and long and you just bring everybody in and it's no longer like really a a, a cover two, four, three. It's like a let's all go get the quarterback type of thing, like what the Giants used to do back in the day. Um, so, you know, I said that to say, Right now, in this moment, basing it off last year and moving forward, I'm taking Robert Quinn over Khalil Mack. Robert Quinn had the best season as a pass rusher in Bears history. Khalil Mack didn't come close to having that impact. Again, I know even like bringing up 2018 sort of feels wrong because he had a huge game one that helped pad those stats. And the rest of the way, it was like very on and off as to whether or not he was there that day. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like, And and that was, it was funny because... And again, I don't want to go into the diatribe on Khalil Mack, but like I, t- I had that conversation with my cousin. I, other Oakland Raiders fans were like, "Good luck." Like he, he's supremely talented, but he takes weeks off. Like, go ahead, have him. Good luck with it. Like, I, I'm glad we got value for. And now, when we got rid of him, I feel the same way. I'm like, "Good luck. Go ahead, take him. Take him, Chargers. You, you guys can have him." <laughs> Granted, he's the second fair, pass rusher, so yeah, he yeah, didn't need to be, to be fair, that guy, Raiders. but. The Raiders didn't win that trade. Nobody won that trade. Nobody and, won the trade. Back on it, Nobody won the trade, bad. which is unfortunate because we're the ones that got elite talent from the trade, like immediate elite yeah. talent. So it looks worse on us, to be honest with you. But um, I just want to touch on that. But I think overall, Jack, before I throw it to you, I think we've this defense is going to be a lot better than last year. I mean, I know you know people are really upset with the secondary picks, but that shored up clear holes that were there last year. Um and and I I just think I'm not saying top ten or anything like that, but I mean what were they what, two years ago in a bland defense they were what top eight or top not like it's not unforeseeable for them to be a top ten defense. I'm I'm going to be honest with you, Frank. I, I expect I expect top fifteen, top ten defense. If I'm being completely honest, because here and, and here's the reason why. You knew the criticism your team was going to take by not selecting an offensive-minded head coach. Simple as that. You knew what this was going to look like. You knew you kind of it, – it really did feel kind of like the safer route with a guy whose defense you know inside and out with Lovey Smith, right? Like this is the same exact type of defense. However, So if your focus is going to be on that side of the ball – that focus better be damn good right away because this offense needed to look right right away to get the fans to buy in. Like, that's just, it is what it is. Matt Eberflus, what he did in Indianapolis, like, I, I, I Chris Ballard deserves a ton of credit, obviously. The scouts, like, his, his front office deserves a ton of credit for finding these guys, Kenny Moore, Darius Leonard, Things like that. But guess who was fucking coaching them up and turning them into all pro players? It's fucking Matt Eberflus, man. Like, this team is going to take the ball away. It's going to be what we saw with Vic Fangio. And they're going to make this a lot easier for, for Justin Fields. Because, I mean, really, Frank, like, you look at it. What have they really lost on this defense outside of some big names? Like, they, they have Jalen Johnson right there. We all saw cornerback one, right? Everybody is just impressed by him. Stay healthy. I think he's he's going to be – no one talks about him, which is which is a little strange. You know, I, Patrick Sertan, all that stuff, J.C. Horn. Like, <laughs> Jalen Johnson was right up there last year with him. Uh, so, I agree. Kyler Gordon, it's not – you know, it's not the sexiest pick. It's a cornerback, uh, especially one that's not even going to be your starter. But you're right. Cornerback two was a 
huge issue last year with just trying to fill in Kindle Vildor, like all these guys who just should not have even been coming close to that position of quarterback too. And then you kind of look at the secondary. Eddie Jackson was an all pro in 2018 because his prime focus was to take the ball away. That's what Brisker is going to let him do. That's that's like they have two of the most athletic safeties back there now. Uh, as long as one is willing to hit, I think the other one will be fine. Matt Eberflus knows how to make this work. Uh, you look up front, you know, Eddie Goldman, he was a very good player while he was here, but you and I both know he had he had completely run his course. Uh, they, they fill that in with a defensive tackle. I'm not – it doesn't even seem that difficult to replace if I'm being hundred percent honest with you. Uh, and you still have Roquan Smith going to be an all pro. Like he deserves that respect. He's that good. I don't know if Roquan will be able to be the kind of playmaker Darius Leonard is. I don't necessarily think that's his skill set, but I still think Roquan, Sw- Roquan Smith is Roquan Smith and he's still going to be a very damn good player in this defense. Yeah. And, and I think I lean I lean towards you a little bit, but I don't think I'm I'm quite there with with the faith that it can be. Top 15 is feasible. Top 10, I think, may be tough. Because as weird as it sounds, Jack, I think there are more question marks today, you know, May 18th to 2022, about the defense than there are about the offense. And, and not about, like, who's going to be better. I think there's, as it stands right now, there's probably more talent on the defensive end. But because we're switching to a 4-3, we just don't know exactly who's going to be what. The secondary, we know who our corners are now. They're, they're, that that should be that should be good. And he, he, just like you said, even if um, uh, even if Kyler isn't the cornerback too, he's going to be a damn good slot. So if, in his first year, like he's going to for these nickel packages, which is needed. You know, like that. That's the other thing. Uh, people are, are are you know upset at these corners going early and like why did the Bears take corner this and that. These receivers are getting paid more and more because they make more and more of an impact. How do you stop a receiver? It's not fucking rocket science with a cornerback, dummy. That's why you get them. That's why you stack that room. That that's what that's what happens when running backs were the highest paid players on offense. Who was the highest paid players on defense? Linebackers, because they're the ones that shoot the gap to get them. It, I mean, this is it's the you know it's the give and take of, of the NFL. That's what happens. Um, so we know that's there. The bit the biggest question mark for me on defense is I, what you're saying is correct about Eddie Jackson, but there still has to be a level of um, accountability on him. He was, he has I, been bad. I, I, I agree. He was out of position. I totally understand. He, he went from free safety to strong safety for God knows what reason. He's never been a tackler. You were in his all pro year. You were like, remember you were screenshotting tweets from 2018. Like what fucking route was that, Eddie? <laughs> and like he's in the middle of having a year where he had like 12 picks, <laughs> but it's like, but no, but, but it's so I, 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 I get that. So what he has to prove, and this is the question mark, were you out of position? Or were you just never that good? Because you only had one good year. You only had one elite year, right? Yeah. So it's like that. that's a huge question mark for me. The other question mark, and it's really at every level of the defense, and that's why I say it's, it's um, you know, there's more question marks there. What are the linebackers going to look like? The, yeah. with, like he, Roquan has never played middle linebacker in a 4-3 at the pro level. Is he going to be the Mike? Is he going to be the Will? We have no idea. And if he is going to be the middle – is he going to be the, the leader of that? Or, is, or are we going to have someone that's playing more of a Briggs? But see, but this is the thing. I was just going to say, is he going to be more of the Briggs type where once Erlacher left, he was still on the outside, but calling. But he reminds me more of Briggs than he does of Erlacher. Where you brought up Dar- Darius Leonard reminds me more of Erlacher in a 4-3 than he, he feels more of like the cleanup. So we may be a year from now, which isn't the worst position to be in. We may be looking for a, a middle linebacker with him being more of the Briggs type. What I'll say about uh, so Eddie Jackson, first of all, I totally agree. You, you're absolutely correct. He is definitely not worthy of his own cereal at this point, right? Like that's that's pretty 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 simple to understand at this at this level. What I will say is, I mean, you think about the guys they were putting next to him in, at the safety position. I mean, Brisker is gonna, by far going to be the best other safety that he's had to work with in Chicago. Like it's not even, I mean, that, that's what you're drafting. That's what you're hoping is the case. So 
you know, how much of it was Eddie Jackson trying to cover as much as he possibly could because the other safety maybe just wasn't very good. Like, they were trying it. Just they, they were kind of just throwing people at that second safety spot. Oh, we got Eddie Jackson. It'll be fine. So how much can Brisker kind of help him take, whether it's half the field, a third of the field, whatever it is, I think you already are going to see Eddie Jackson being a, a little bit more freed up in terms of what he can do. Um, so I think that that can help. But I agree with you. I, obviously, he needs to prove that he still is any sort of resemblance to that all pro guy that everybody trusted. So I, I, I completely agree with you there in terms of the linebacker thing. I'm not as concerned about what that will look like. Um, obviously, you know, with Roquan, they signed Nicholas Morrow. They didn't draft a linebacker, right? They didn't sign a big name linebacker. So to me, that tells me they feel comfortable with who's, going to be in that role not quite sure who the third linebacker is I don't know if Travis Gibson is maybe going to continue he's definitely more of an end type player yep pass rush player especially with Robert Quinn on the other side so I still really like that front four I think that front four is Justin Jones uh the signing from the Chargers um obviously they were supposed to have uh Ogan Joby which would have been really nice but is what it is at this point I so I Yes, there are questions. I agree. I just don't think there's as many questions as on the offensive side, of, of course. I've seen, I, I definitely have a different perspective, uh, you know, with having watched uh, yeah. Eber Flus with the Colts. So um, maybe I'm a little bit, it, it's almost the, <laughs> it's almost the exact inverse of how you and I felt about Chuck Pagano coming in. Uh, what was that? 20, 2020 or 2019, something like that. Um, one of the, I think it was 2019. And I remember it, you were like, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like this defense is, is there's nothing, you know, it's more of the players at this point. He just has to call the right plays. And I was like, I'm, I'm telling you, man, that's not his strong suit. He doesn't know what the fucking right plays are. But now it's kind of the flipped where it's like Eberflus. I, I trust him. I know this fucking acronym stuff is bothering a lot of people for some fucking reason. I don't. Yeah. Uh, just taking it so seriously. But He's going to put this defense in the right position to make big plays. And that's what we've been missing. Like, it's great, you know, that the at, at, towards the end, you know, Sean Desai was more of that bend, don't break. I thought he did a fine job. But what we were missing from that 2018 season with Vic Fangio was the turnovers. They needed to turn the ball over and make it a shorter field for bad quarterbacks. Not necessarily what they're going to have to do now because Justin Fields is a better quarterback prospect than you know what we've seen here ever in our in in my opinion. So I just think this defense has that. I I expect my expectations are a lot higher for the defense than they are for the offense. See, I don't even know if it's an expectation thing for me. I think. As it stands goals, right now, maybe, maybe a the, goals thing. What, what yeah, you're, what yeah, you're yeah, setting yeah, yeah. Goals for? I guess that makes more sense. Yeah, but, but it's it, I just also I don't. It's hard for me to even set anything because I don't know who's going to be where on on the the first two levels of the defense. We have no idea where the linebackers are going to be. We know who the probably who the uh, defensive ends are going to be with uh, Robert Quinn and uh, and Travis Gibson, who I, I want to touch on. I know Justin Jones is, is very talented. He, he was, you know, uh, compared to Larry Ogunjobi, but his problem is staying on the field. We saw what it looks like when an impact player isn't there, you know, when Goldman was out for a year and Akeem Hicks is hurt every two games. So it's like that that's where the questions really start is that defensive line. But in terms of Matt Eberflus's ability to coach people up and like have this scheme, I have full faith in that. I'm just talking about year one. I don't know where the hell the chips are going to fall, but I know we also have um, – Angelo Blackson is a really good defensive tackle that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people probably don't even know about. Um, I was just looking up and down the roster uh, from from last year. Uh, who the hell? We, we drafted another defensive end that people seem to be pretty high and thought he'd be more of like a fourth or fifth round pick. There was another uh, nose tackle that I really liked, and I'm, I'm blank. I, that's why I pull up the roster. And I'm blanking on his name. Um, so, I mean, I guess it just depends on where, where things fall. I, I just feel like things are on the offensive end. It's, pretty straightforward we know where people are going to be now which is yeah. like is luke getsy legit you know what i mean like can yeah. he it can is justin fields the guy like we're going to start seeing a little bit more of that um but jack i mean to me overall 
the the whole panic and in, in, in the you know the the bottom of the NFL that could still be that that could still be true. We we may only win six games, five games. I don't think they're like one or two wins. I I, I think that's unless like injuries happen, then it is what it is. Um, but I think we have improved this roster, or th- this is an improved roster this year than last year. And I don't even think it's like I don't think it's close. And w- when you look at it from that aspect. You had a coach who couldn't get out of his own way. I mean, he was clearly inept. We've talked, we've said it in so many words with Nagy. I mean, we'll continue to say it, but, but you know, it's, but we, we have a coaching staff now that just has to be competent and you probably have the roster to win like four just based on talent or five based on talent. Yeah. And then you look like you, you brought this up in the pre, you look at the, the schedule. Like we have, you know, we have games that we should win, but then speaking of last year, again, we won six games, and we probably should have won that Steelers game. The refs the just completely game. fucked them. They should have won the 49ers game. That was just us shooting ourselves. But, like, there were games we were still in yeah. with a coach that couldn't do a fucking thing. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you 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 look at it, right? Like, so, so again, not to not to go through the whole schedule in terms of, you know, growing wins, losses, whatever. But, uh, you know, 49ers— they, they they themselves are an unknown. If they're going with Trey Lance, we don't know what that offense is really going to look like. I hope they do. I want to see that matchup week one. I, I would absolutely. I think that would be a super fun game. It's, it's I know. I agree. Sunday. It's a noon game. It's it's at home. Like that would be a really fun game to start the season off. I, I totally am on board with that, um, especially because that was one of the better games we, we got last year. It was year. very uh, good. Then you got uh, Sunday night football at Green Bay week two. Uh, Sunday night football like that is going to be a huge game I think I'm not going to say measuring stick because this team isn't they're right. not in that mode but it's going to be a great opportunity for Justin Fields and this offense to prove what they can do right and and honestly what this defense can do because it's by far the best defense they'll go up against for at least four uh two more weeks um you look like you're you're about to Start no, I, 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 no, I was just going to say, it, right now we can't call it a measuring stick game. If we beat the brakes off of the Niners in week one and this offense looks awesome, we may change our tune of like, okay, yeah. like we beat, because I, you know. But then, of course, I, I don't know but then good, of course, we all get super, we, you know, you and I are like, all right, here we go, fucking bear. And then they get, you know, stomped 45 to three. In, but but, then, but that, that's, that, I, I think that's an appropriate reality check if that were to be the case. Yeah. If we beat, I mean, because like I, I would, I would rather it be as weird as this sounds. I would rather it be like, you know, the Niners maybe are a middling team, not that good of a team, and we stomp them, you know, forty-five to fifty or whatever it is, and then we lose to the Packers bad. And you're like, okay, let's temper the expectation. The Niners maybe we're just bad, and we're like a middle level team, you know, mid like a Bengals team. type situation. Versus right, ver- versus like, oh, we got. The, the Niners and the Texans and the Lions and like we're rolling in three and zero against Green Bay and then you give and it's like okay fine. that's a gut punch you know yeah, what I mean like I would rather because I think those are appropriate <laughs> games because again like the Niners they're they're so they're, they could probably be a playoff team you're never doubting Kyle Shanahan but, but talent wise I don't think anyone's like thinking they're a top NFC like oh my goodness type of team so like I I, I don't mind that at all so it may be yeah. it, it could be a measuring stick type of game to some degree at least. Yeah, then like because because you make it great, and you know you let's say they do lose uh, to the Packers, which probably will happen uh, week two. Then you get the Texans, Giants, Vikings back to back to, and I'm sorry, let me clarify that: Texans, Giants, Vikings, Commanders, four straight weeks. Schedule. I- I'm sorry, like you can say what you want about the Vikings. I know they're year in and year out. It's all oh, this is the Vikings. They're a talented roster, and never they never do anything. Yes, they have a better, you know, they have a very good quarterback and and arguably the best receiver in football. But, like, they have a rookie head coach who who they weren't going to even hire until Jim Harbaugh was like, nah, I'm going to stay in Michigan. Fuck you guys. Like, and and then the commanders, Carson Wentz, that that really do it for you? Thursday night football game at home? Like, I don't know when's the last time Washington has done it for me. Like, RG3's rookie year? Even then, I mean, he sucked. So, uh (laughs) <laughs> then they go on the road to New England at Dallas versus the Dolphins. I, I mean, 
I'm sorry, dude. Those are winnable games. I don't know. I, I don't know. New England, New England, probably not. Uh, it's it's at New England. We know Bill and how he handles rookie rookie quarterbacks. Um, look at his own rookie quarterback through three fucking passes, and they still won. So uh, Dallas, I, I never know with Dallas, man. But they're, I, they're yeah, they're they're there's they're streaky, and if they're if they're hot, that's tough. That offense is still gonna be. Yeah. When, when they just need to find consistency that they may never find, but it's Mike McCarthy, man. Like, <laughs> I, 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 don't I don't know. I don't know. I get it. I, I don't know. The Dolphins. Well, that, that's going to be a wait and see. We we don't know to, uh, because yeah. if if indeed you know for for as much as we liked uh, Brian Flores, if indeed he was holding the offense back and things, and and, and you know Mike McDaniel is the guy to unlock Tua, and and they got all these playmakers now, we may be looking at them as a juggernaut. Well, who knows? So that that I one, that I'm. I'm I saw that arm strength from Tua in that video. Holy we all saw it, Frank. Holy <laughs> shit. Uh, then you get the Lions, obviously, Atlanta, the Jets. I mean, both very, very winnable games. Uh, Packers at home, um, week 13. You hit the bye, late bye week for the Bears this year, week 14. Um, I'm not I'm not a big fan of that, those week 14 bye weeks. Uh, I, th- I just think that's, that's too late. late. Yeah, it's, that's it's, a it's super really late, late bye week. Um, the Eagles... Bills, Lions, Vikings. So like two, you end the season with maybe a couple potential playoff teams. Uh, the Eagles, I think, got only better this offseason. I still, you know, jury's still out if if uh, Jalen Hurts is is the guy to, you know, bring everything together. We'll see. But there's, I, and again, I, I, I know it's tough. You know, you talked about this before, um, you know, in, in other podcasts before, I think even last year as well, where it was kind of just like, I mean, you can talk about the schedule all you want, strength of schedule. Well, these teams were fucking terrible last year, so they're going to be terrible. That's not how the NFL works. Yep. But if you just even look at it based off the context of this offseason, those teams I mentioned, some of them don't even have a fucking starting quarterback right now. Like the Falcons, you don't know who's week one. We don't know who the 49ers starting quarterback is going to be. So. I think there are reasons to be optimistic. I look at that schedule right now and I say, that is a reason they will be good as opposed to next week when we talk about why <laughs> why we're, we're completely pessimistic about why this team will absolutely fucking suck. The schedule, to me, doesn't reflect that because there aren't that many difficult games on paper at this point. Yeah, Taking no, into agree. context this offseason as well, I want to make that very clear. I'm not looking at it based off the Falcons don't have Matt Ryan anymore. Like they, They're not going to have Calvin Even Ridley if they probably. Did. I mean, Even if they did. Right. Like, that's what I'm saying. So even taking into this the context of what they were last year and then what they did in the draft, in free agency, things like that. Fuck, man, the Packers lost Devontae Adams and did absolutely nothing to replace him outside of drafting uh, a division two wide receiver. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's the the NFC, the NFC isn't all that scary. It remains, I think, top heavy, which which is why. Yeah, again, you know, n- next week we're going to talk about why the Bears are going to suck next year and, and get that top, which really wouldn't be the the, the worst outcome either. Um, you know, in terms of like, and that, that's really what I wanted to end on, Jack, is like my, what, what I want out of this team, whether or not they make the playoffs, whether they win two games or 14 games, be fun to watch. Play yeah. for the love of God. <laughs> like, just be like, be the, that 49ers and Steelers game, even if we're losing those games, be that. I just want to like, I want to be excited. Like, Let's have some guys that people like can root for fantasy wise. Like, I, I mean, how, how many we're, we're in dynasty leagues where I think we're both in like, I'm in four. Well, you're probably in three or four. Like when is the last time? Well, for you, probably never in dynasty, but the last time someone came to me like, <laughs> Hey man, I, I'm thinking about starting someone. It was Tariq Cohen in 2018. <laughs> like also, people started a Rob. Cause it, it is what it was. You know, he, he, he was an elite yeah. receiver for some years, but like, Jesus, dude, like, give us something. Like, just give me a little umph. Give me something to get also, excited about. Also, we, we'd be remiss not to not to uh, at least mention Tariq Cohen and that awful Achilles injury that he suffered. Yeah. Training, looking probably, I mean, on one hand, you're like, why would you be posting workouts on Instagram Live? Like, that, it, that can't be a good idea ever. But on the other hand, you're probably like, well, he's probably using it to get teams excited about, yep. you know, what and, and interested again. So, and from what all this dude went through, I, I mean, I, it was a tough situation for, for Bears fans because, like, we needed 
they the, the Bears needed him to play. They needed his skill set, and it just he just kind of disappeared. And we never got a real clear answer until after he was cut and Ryan Pace was gone. And then just seeing him suffer an injury while he's working out like that, I felt bad, man. That, that I did hurt. too. Can I, I? I will say in the whole situation, I I really hope that the Bears do similar things to the, the, what they did with uh, with Zach Miller. Like, br- bring him in, fucking make up a job title. Let let him rehab there, because he's probably, I mean, he may not ever play football again in the NFL. I mean, you're talking an ACL, what what was the other, was it ACL and MCL? And then he fractured his, his tibia, I believe it was. Yeah, and then and then you're going right off of that to with that that already wasn't healing properly like that that was made clear in the article as well and then right to a torn achilles i mean let this guy be anything literally make up a title for five years let let, let him let him stack some (laughs) some more money up and let me just say too i I wasn't like ever super upset at the the tyree cohen uh, re-signing it was a little peculiar with like alan robinson have a contract yet so like the timing of it was weird but this is why I always root for players to get their money because yep. shit happens. Like these guys are fucking billionaires that own this team. They, they're going to live off of the 20 million or whatever it was. They lost off of, uh, they didn't even really lose it. They made it back. Bears fans buy fucking tickets. They buy Jersey. Like they, they didn't lose it. Like they're fine. So when, when people get paid, man, like I'm, I'm all for that. Like that people need to be paid more. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's in all walks how of life. I want more was, money too. I, yeah, well, I, I agree. I, I mean, Jack, you don't get me called a communist on this. I wasn't prepared to, to, to you know, bring my Marxist talking points. Uh, but um, no, I, I mean, you think about how electric he was, man. Those first two years, he was like the only reason to watch that Bears offense for a couple years. Let's make no mistake. I know we soured on him because it was like, all right, Tariq, you're going east and west. Like, what the fuck's going on here? Like, start running forward. But those first two seasons, man, that motherfucker was a baller. I mean, th- th- who else, like over the last since Devin Hester left, who has been more exciting in those two years of Tariq Cohen? Jordan Howard uh, like played, but he was a oh, fucking bowling ball. Stop, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, no, no. That's what I'm saying. Like, l- l- look at what the competition is as to like who was great to watch on the offensive Jer- side of the football. Jer- Jeremy Langford. Jeremy Langford was awful. <laughs> also, he was before Tariq, so that doesn't count, anyways. Yeah. Well, he was post Devin Hester, though. That's what I said. Like, uh, post, oh, post Devin, who? Josh Bellamy. Um, God, you know, I'm going to fucking uh, throw up. Who is, who is the guy? Oh, my God. See, I've, I've literally already forgotten his name. Who is the guy in the Saints game that dropped the touchdown pass and then threw a punch later in that game? Who, who, what was his name? Wims. Javon Wims. Thank you. Javon Wims. See, I've already forgotten his name. That's how yeah. memorable. Well, may, I guess was. maybe I think that the case that you could make was uh, Trey Burton that first year as a Bear. He had a really good year, but even Trey then Burton, it was like Allen Robinson, I guess. Nah, nothing was a possession was, guy though. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Not like what yeah. Tariq was doing. Electric. You're talking like electric. Yeah. Yes, I nothing, mean there was nothing. no one close post Hester to, to him. David so. Montgomery. As much as I like David Montgomery, he's not like he's more of like. He's like a he's like a worse Matt Forte. <laughs> that that sounds bad. That that sounds a little disrespectful because David, David Montgomery has been a very good player when he's he actually player. gets a chance to touch the ball. But he's not he's not Matt Forte. Yes, yeah, I agree. Just, no, but I mean all you know, I'm wishing nothing but the best for Tyreek Cohen, man. That's agreed. that it, that that sucks. And, and you're right. I'm I'm glad I'm glad I you know I'm glad that we brought him up, uh, so we had a chance to 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 touch on that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, Frank, uh, next week we're we're going to dive into why you know all of this podcast was for nothing and why the Bears will win two games and they'll be drafting C.J. Stroud or uh, Bryce Young or uh, you know one of those other fifteen thousand oh. quarterbacks that people are already hyping up more than, more than this offense. Well, I mean that's what's going to happen, Jack. They gave up on Justin Fields. Well, they've already have like they didn't. That's even what I'm saying. It's, it's over with. Yeah, it's, he's just the bridge quarterback. <laughs> oh god, so stupid, Frank. I hate. I hate it. I hate. I hate. I hate this fandom so much. But I also love it at the same time, which is why we dedicated this whole podcast to them. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll come back next week. We'll do a little bit more, uh, a little more Bears defense and an offense, and why it's not going to work, and why it's just 
it's going to be the same old, same old we've seen time and time again. Until then, I'm Jack. He's Frank. This is the Bear With Us podcast. We appreciate you guys listening. As always, like, subscribe wherever you're listening. Uh, go hit us up on YouTube if you want to watch our faces while we do this for some reason. I, I don't know but what's wrong with you if you do, but we'll take it. We'll take it because we need that money, as Frank said. As, as Frank said, we're, uh, we're a capitalist society and we, and we need that. We need that money. You're goddamn right. Later, everybody. <laughs> Later, Jackie.